God's grace has put everything that we need in the word, in terms of the word, in the form of the word of God, in, in the form of the precious promises of God. And God has spoken it forth and he has given it to us. Unless we respond to it by saying something that shows our faith in that, nothing is going to happen. Him for His grace and favor to our fathers in distress. Praise Him still the same forever, slow to chide and swift to bless. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Glorious in His faithfulness. Father, like He tends and spares us, well our feeble frame He knows. In His hands He gently bears us, rescues Bible promises are different. When someone makes a promise, they are not called precious promise. They are seasonal promises. <laughs> Sometimes they mean well, but they can't do it. They are unable to do it. Some of these men, they make it in, with good intentions, you know. They want to do this, they want to do that. And when that but then they get into some kind of a jam and they, they cannot get out of it. They cannot do what they said they will do. Some of them make promises knowing that they won't be able to do it. You can tell by the way they make the promises, they will never be able to do it. You can't do that. But they'll say, we'll do it. Because they just want to say this and gain some power or something. But they'll never be able to do it. Knowing that, they'll tell you that. But they're not, that's why they're not precious promises. 
whether they are well-intentioned or bad people just promising false things, you know, because they cannot bring it to pass, those promises cannot be called the precious promises. But the Bible promises are called precious because of the nature of the promise. God is making it. He is able. He will never come back to you and tell you, sorry, excuse me, I didn't have the majority, so I couldn't do it. <laughs> he doesn't need any majority. He is the majority by himself. <laughs> he will do it. He doesn't need anybody's help. He will do it. So whatever he promises, he will do it. God is never going to come back to you and, uh, you know, tell you, give you excuses for his failure. God is able to do it. That's why Jeremiah 1.12, which we read last week, is important. I will hasten to perform my word, God says. God watches over his word to perform it. That means he's careful. He wants to perform it. One word will not be wasted. One word will not fail. He's watching over his word. That's the way God is because he can do it. And he wants to do it. He's eager to do it. He's not delaying it. He's in a hurry to do it. He wants to do it. So God's promises are precious promises. That's why 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, Paul Peter talks about how God has given us precious promises. I love that expression, precious promises. God's promises are precious because they never fail. That's why it's precious. Not one word will fail from God's promise. That is why they are precious. The blood of Jesus is precious because no blood can do what the blood of Jesus can do. No blood can wash away your sin. We sing, what can wash away your sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's why it's precious. When something is precious, there is something very special about it. The special nature of God's word is that not one single word will fail. That's the way God's word is. Amen? So, God is like that. God is a faithful God, and God is one who fulfills all his word. But the thing is, and he's, he's, he hastens to perform his word, according to Jeremiah 1.12, or he watches over, some translations say. So, because he's watching over, he's hastening to perform the word, but still, in many people's life, that word never comes true. The realization of the promises of God are not there. They never see the promises of God realized. Why? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth in bird, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. We've talked a lot about this, but let me say some new things here. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. In other words, water comes down, rain comes down, waters the earth, makes it bud and bring forth, so that we have food for the eater. Eh? Everyone is an eater, right? So, we get food because rain comes down, waters the earth, and... Uh, causes it to grow. That's what the water, uh, rain does. So is my word. Just like the rain that comes down, waters the earth and brings forth and gives food for the eater, my word is also something that comes down from heaven, he says. And uh, it, my word that goes forth from my mouth is similar to that. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I Send it. That means just like that gives food, this meets all your need. My word is sent to meet some need. Rain is sent to meet a need, to bring you a harvest so that you have food to eat. My word is sent to meet a need, to bring that which I desire, that which I want to give to you, I give to you by sending my word. Like rain is sent down to the earth. I send my word. And the word comes down and the word brings forth the very thing that you need. Your needs are met by my word, he says. And what happens when the needs are met? You shall go out with joy, be led with peace. Mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. And instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Notice, thorns and thistles mentioned here. 
Instead of thorns, you'll have cypress tree. Instead of briar, shall come up myrtle tree. Why it's mentioned? Because thorns and thistles represent a curse, difficult life. Thorns and thistles represent poverty, lack, insufficiency, insufficiency, want in every area of life. Thorns and thistles represent how through the fall, life has become very difficult. We live in a fallen world. Life is not the same as it was in the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve. It's become difficult. Since chapter 3 of Genesis, you read that thorns and thistles began to grow. Before Adam sinned, there was no thorns and thistles. Only what you sowed grow. Now, the thorns and thistles, you know, you, you, have, you have to spend more than half the time just removing the thorns and thistles so that what you sowed can grow. Great difficulties are there. And he says, my word comes forth. And what happens when the word comes is that it helps you to overcome the difficulties so that instead of thorns and thistles overwhelming you, you begin to win because good things begin to come up in life. You are able to overcome the difficulties. You are able to prosper. You are able to go forward. You are able to win. You are able to walk in victory. You are empowered in other words. That's what the word does, he says. But... Something must happen. What must happen? The word must come forth from God's mouth. Has the word come forth? Yes, it has come forth. God has spoken. What do you think this big Bible is all about? God has spoken. What do you think these promises are all about? Somebody said 6,000 promises are there. Thank God for them. And once in a while we take these promises and we, you know, frame them, hang them, memorize them, you know, <laughs> preach on them and so on, you know. If we just spent all, the, all our life just preaching every Sunday on one promise, you know, one life is not enough. That's how many promises are there. So many wonderful promises of God are there. God has spoken it. It's not that God has spoken it. My word that comes forth out of my mouth will produce what you need, he says. It has come forth out of his mouth. But how does it... How, does, how is that word sent to our situation? God has spoken it all right. But unless you take the promise of God and you say it, nothing happens. God has spoken it, but you must be like a prophet now. You must take it. That's why we read, God has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, have you ever read that? God has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Why he has said it? So you can frame it and hang it. It's good that we frame it and hang it, but the thing is, the ultimate use of the word of God is, God has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Why? So that you may boldly say something in response to that. What is your response to what God has said? He has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly say, God is my helper. I am not afraid. What shall man do unto me? It is to evoke a response from you like that. The promises are given. Unless the promise evokes a response from you in that manner, no matter how many promises God are giving you, if you don't speak in response to it, no matter how many promises are there, it's not going to help you any. So much can be there in the bank. If you don't know how to withdraw it, you're not, never going to have anything. Right? It doesn't matter how many crores are there in the bank you've got, how many millions you have. If you don't know how to take it out, you can't have it. God's grace has put everything that we need in the Word, in terms of the Word, in the form of the Word of God, in, in the form of the precious promises of God. And God has spoken it forth and He has given it to us. Unless we respond to it by saying something that shows our faith in that, nothing is going to happen. That is why our speaking the word is so important, you know. So shall be my word that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, he says. It will never come to me, come back to me void. So when it comes forth out of God's mouth, God is sending it forth. So shall my word be that, that, is, that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. Notice the expression. It goes forth out of his mouth. Yes, he has spoken, it's there. How does it go back? It goes back when you say, Lord, you have said this way. You know how, you know how uh, Solomon prayed one time? 
He prayed a prayer, very clever prayer. He said, Lord, whatever you said to my father David, you do that. <laughs> I like that prayer. The man is very to the point, you know. God can't say no to that. <laughs> There is no answer for that. So many people preach about why there is sometimes yes, why there is no, why there is wait and all that, you know. But Solomon, the way Solomon prayed, God can never say no. He said, I am not asking you anything. Whatever you told my daddy, do that. That's all I want from you. That must be our prayer. Whatever you told me, Lord, here. Whatever your word says, whatever your precious promise says, whatever your word declares, that you do for me. That must be our prayer. It is not by much uh, words our prayers are heard. Some people think if you use long sentences, God likes our proficiency in using the language, you know. And so if you use nice flowery long sentences, God hears such prayers, you know, because you really know how to pray. Well, people will know that you have some command of words, but God doesn't care about all that. God says, when you come to me, you tell me what I have said. You remind me of my promises. You put me to remembrance what I have said. You ask, you see, that shows your faith. That shows that you got it. That shows you believe it. You stand on it. You put me to remembrance on it, right? So it is important. God is, God's word has come forth. It must be returned. When you speak, it returns. When he speaks, it comes to you. When you speak, it returns to him. And when it returns to him, it will never return void. It will accomplish. When it, go, when, when it reaches the point of returning to God, it will accomplish what it came to do. Amen? Now turn to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. Notice... Jesus Christ is called, not simply a high priest, he's called the high priest of our confession. Why is he called the high priest of our confession? Why this strange thing? If he just said high priest, the Jewish people that were reading the book of Hebrews back in those days, it was written for a Jewish audience, Jewish Christians. They understood the Jewish background and the customs and the, and the tabernacle, the temple, the... Uh, holy of holies and how the high priest went in there, sprinkled the blood, all that they understood, right? So if he just said, we have a high priest, consider the high priest, they would have understood. But he says, consider the high priest of our confession. Why? Why is the high priest of our confession? Listen to this. In order to understand this, you need to understand what happened in the Old Testament, what the Old Testament high priest was all about, because he's using that analogy that Jesus Christ is our high priest. What did the high priest do in the Old Testament? under the old covenant. The high priest, they had one high priest in the nation of Israel, and uh, he will, every year, his main job was to, on the day of atonement, sacrifice a lamb for the sin of the people. And uh, he will take the blood of that lamb. This is all figurative, you know. It was all to teach them about salvation, about how the lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ himself, will shed his blood and so on. The lamb that is killed there represented all the people's sins because before he put the lamb on the altar and killed it, he laid his hands upon it and confessed all the sins of the people over that lamb. So all the sin of the people now was put upon the lamb when he confessed it upon the lamb. So the lamb became like a sin, like sin, <laughs> because the people's sin were confessed over it. Then the lamb died. The lamb was killed because the killing of the lamb represented the judgment of God. The soul that sin shall die. The wages of sin is death, God declares. Therefore, the lamb is killed and people saw it and they knew what was happening. We confessed our sins over the priest, confessed it on our behalf, on the animal, and then killed the animal, which represents that the sin now, the lamb's sin, and therefore the lamb as a sinner dies because it has become sin. It carries my sin. It dies for my sin. And once the lamb is killed, the blood is taken, and the high priest goes into what is called the Holy of Holy, Holies, which is the innermost sanctum of the tabernacle and the temple later on. Now, you can go to other areas of the temple, but you cannot go to this innermost place of the, uh, of the temple or tabernacle, which is called Holy of Holies. Why? Because that's where God is. 
you know, God said, that's where I am. So there's a curtain there. You cannot, cannot cross the curtain. When the high priest comes, you know, uh, he himself has to offer sacrifice for himself and make sure that he is cleansed in every way and enter into it very carefully. Because if he enter into it unworthy in a sinful manner, because God is holy and man is a sinner, he's got to be very careful. This fact of God's holiness and man's sin was emphasized in that way. So when the high priest entered, he entered having offered a sacrifice for himself and for the people, carrying the blood as a representative of the people. See, a high priest is a representative. He takes people to God and he brings God's word to the people. He's a link between God and man. He's the mediator, like he's, he's right there in the middle between God and man. So he offers a sacrifice, takes the blood and goes in. If he goes in unworthy, he'll die. That's why they tied a rope around him. And, uh, and in case he died there, they can't even go pick him up. They have to just pull him out, you know. Uh, that's how serious this business was. So he went in there, and what did he do there? As a high priest, once a year only he could do this. He went in there and sprinkled this blood on what is called the mercy seat. What is the mercy seat? There was in the Holy of Holies this uh, Ark of the Covenant in which, it's a box, in which the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses, written with his fingers, is there. That Ark of the Covenant contained the Ten Commandments. And there, it had a lid on top of it, and that is what is called the mercy seat. Upon the lid, he sprinkled this blood. Why? Why did he have to sprinkle? What did, what did it mean? It was all, it all had a message, you know. The coven, com commandment being there meant that the commandment, the Ten Commandment was doing its job. The, the purpose for which it was given, it was doing. What was the purpose for the Ten Commandment? Not to justify a man, not to make a man righteous. It was never. The Ten Commandment was given to prove that man is a sinner and that he needs a savior. It was to prove that man cannot do it. He will not succeed doing it because even though the Ten Commandments are good, man is evil, therefore he is unable to do it. So, the Ten Commandment is there. What was it doing? It was doing its job. What, its jo what is its job? It is accusing man. A voice of accusation was heard night and day in the presence of God, calling upon man the judgment of God, death upon man, for he is a sinner. That's the way the commandment worked. It was doing its job, accusing man that he is a sinner, that God's judgment must come upon him. And right in the middle of that, he goes and sprinkles this blood. What does the sprinkling of the blood upon that mercy seat, the lid, means? It, when he sprinkled the blood, it meant now that the voice is now silenced. The voice of accusation is silenced. Why is it silenced? Because the blood is the proof that man, man's sin has already been taken care of. His sin has been confessed over the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, and the animal has been killed, signifying that God's judgment has come upon that animal. And the blood is the proof that the animal has been killed. Punishment has been rendered, given already. So the blood is sprinkled. And when the blood is sprinkled, it is to silence the voice of accusation of the Ten Commandments there. This is what the high priest did. In other words, all that Jesus would do for us in and through redemption was represented in this whole high priestly ministry. Not only Jesus became the Lamb of God who died for our sins, He rose again and became our high priest also. He played the role of the high priest also. He's got many roles to play. He died as a lamb, then He rose again and became our high, our high priest. He took His own blood and went in, not into some temple or tabernacle on earth called Holy of Holies. The book of Hebrews, the whole point it's making is He went right into the very presence of God. That's Hebrews 4.14, the passage we read in the beginning. Therefore, having a high priest who has gone into the heavens, He has gone right into the heavens, not, not into a symbolic place of God's presence, into the very place of God's presence, into the Holy of Holies in heavens. He has walked right in there. And 
world, what did he do there? He has presented his blood there as the proof that the sin of man is taken care of and that man deserves the blessing today, the blessings of God and the favor of God, not the judgment of God, the blessings and the favor of God. <laughs>